is racing going to survive? I mean, based on what's, I don't, I know you guys know what's happening in the world today and it's, it's scary for a lot of people. Um, you know, it looks like we're heading toward electric cars. Uh, it's not a fast transition as some would like. Um, but where, where's racing going with all this? Yeah, no, no, racing's going to survive. It's just going to change. It's different thought process. Old dinosaurs like me are going to be gone. And, so are they going to be potentially electric race cars? Is you that know, what we're I don't, who knows? Ro remote control from the from yeah. the pilot house upstairs? Or, I mean, you know, I don't want to get on my political rant, but <laughs> all you ever hear is about electric cars. Yeah. What about hydrogen-powered cars? Yeah. Now they've got the new synthetic fuel. We don't even have to get oil from the ground. They can make synthetic fuel that they're working on. Personally, myself, I've researched all the different type cars. I think we need an assortment. I think you need gas cars, electric cars, hydrogen cars. You need an assortment, but my personal feeling is hydrogen cars is the way to go. So. But you think racing is going to survive? Oh, it'll survive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it'll survive. well, I'm, I'm glad change. to hear that because I'm not change. hearing that everywhere. And I, <laughs> that's a vote for racing. Um, it reminds me of yesterday when myself and my daughter, this will be of interest to you, uh, because yesterday we drove up to Dearborn, Michigan to the Henry Ford Museum. Oh, Henry just, Ford yeah. was a friend of your grandfather. Yeah. Um, and I read a little billboard up, uh, up, up there yesterday and it said, auto racing was born five minutes after the second car was built. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and there's always going to be at least two cars out there that well, can roll. Anytime... You've got anybody with any competitive spirit. He wants to beat somebody else. Yeah. They want to beat him, and that creates racing. Sure. You know, so is there a prettier race car than the front engine AJ uh, Watson no, Roadster? No. I mean, is there? <laughs> no. I haven't seen one. Yeah, no, they're beautiful cars, and and that's why I mean, there, there's so much interest still in them today, and that's you know that's why I think I mean there's you know you get on Facebook and you look up I mean there's a bunch of different uh, just clubs you know that are. are all about the Watson Roadster, or even the the Curtis Roadster. And... Does the Indy Indy 500 ever get old for you guys? No. It, it's I go through this like the day after. I go through post Indy 500 depression because I like have to wait another year for it to come around again. Well, <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little, but not a lot. Anyway, I'm <laughs> even sorry. Even when go we're ahead. there with the you know the the road Indy cars and you know we're they run on the road course, um, it just it feels good to be there. Yeah, oh, it's so cool. Yeah. It's, I mean, that race, it's so Americana since 1911, yeah. for crying out loud. And outside of World War One and World War Two, there every year, every year since 1911. And that was, what's interesting, it's so Americana, yet in the very, from the very beginning, it was always a foreign affair. I mean, Ray Haroon won the first one in 11, but, you know, Jules Go and the Frenchman and the Dario Resta, an Italian guy came over. So it always had international flavor. Yes. Yeah. So, which, which I thought was interesting. And even more so now, you know. Yeah. I mean, of all the Indy 500s I participated in as far as building motors, working on the cars and stuff, the Indy 500 is a race. It's kind of like the Daytona fight. You never really know. I mean, you can have a guy that's really fast, but he not be, may not be the guy that wins the thing. Because yeah. it's so long, there's so much attrition, there's so many things going on that some dark horse could win it, and it's not always the fastest guy, you know? Yeah. So it's, that's what makes it interesting. So um, your grandfather did know uh, Henry Ford, yeah? I mean, they were they were buddies, they were pals. Good yeah. They yeah, were good friends. In 1939. You're, you're too young for Henry Ford, though, right? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. In 1939, <laughs> when my grandfather crashed, he was on his way to win his fourth 500. I know, I know. And he crashed, and um, he was in the hospital. Henry came to see him, and Henry told him, he goes, Louie goes, um, I'm thinking about starting a business on the West Coast, and they're going to remanufacture... Ford engines, small parts, stuff like that. And he goes, if you'll retire from racing, I'll give you that business. He goes, I'll get it hooked up to where that'll be your business. So anyways, my grandmother looked at my grandfather and said, guess what? You just retired. So they went to California. <laughs> Who's wearing the trousers company. here? <laughs> yeah. He set up a company with, in fact, they bought the old Studebaker plant. Uh, he set up a company with a, uh, with a gentleman named Lou Welch, and it was called Meyer and Welch. And they built a hundred engines a day for Ford cars out there. Oh my plus God! Plus small parts, factory production cars, factory production okay. cars. Yeah, yeah. Well, my grandpa enjoyed doing that. It was different than the racing, but he still missed the racing. So he kept in touch with Fred Offenhauser, 
And he's like, Fred, if you ever want to sell the factory, let me know. Well, one day Fred Offenhauser called him and said, let's go to lunch. So they went out together in the car and Fred goes, Lou, he goes, you want to buy the plant, I'll sell it to you. So he got, he got out of Meyer and Welch, got the money together, got Dale Drake, and they bought and started Meyer and Drake. And that's how the partnership between that's Meyer and Drake became. was born then? You see, Dale was a riding mechanic and a very good friend of my grandpa's. And Dale and Drake mechanic. was a riding mechanic? Yeah, Dale Drake was a riding mechanic. Me. And, um, was he uh, nuts? <laughs> yeah, and, and they had a real good friendship, and he knew how smart Dale was. Dale was a very smart guy. I tell you. Smartest, Did you know Dale Drake? Oh yeah, yeah, I knew Dale and John the whole okay. deal. And, um, but anyways, uh, I'll tell you the guy that really was the driving force behind Meyer and Drake was Leo Goosen. And, uh, I was gonna mention that name. Yeah, I had the pleasure of, when I was young, meeting Leo. In fact, sometimes I'd go there to the shop, hang out, and Leo would let me sit on a chair and watch him. This guy was like a human CAD CAM machine. The way he would do those blueprints and draw stuff and like... So Leo was the, the blueprint guy. He drew it up on the board. He drew it up on the board and he did the design work yeah. because a lot of times my grandpa would go to him and go, okay, we got this and we got this. We need to put it together. We want to do this. And Leo would come up with the actual design of it and draw it. And then they'd make it. Super intelligent. And, you know, he was with Miller and, and right. he was with Meyer and Drake and then he was with Drake. And I mean, he just... Uh, you know, just an uh, amazing guy, amazing guy. Yeah, uh, it's so interesting. And I know that, you know, Offenhauser's greatest greatest era, greatest success came from the the Meyer-Drake partnership because I'm thinking they won like 24 of 20... 25 20s, straight years. Yeah, uh, at the at straight Indianapolis 500s. Yeah. No other engine can claim that, right? Yeah, no, no. No, I mean, they dominated from... I don't know, late 40s, 50s, up into the 60, about 68, I think was their last offy that won there. Yeah. yeah. So you drove sprint cars. Um, can you imagine yourself in a 1928 Miller race car, open cockpit with a leather helmet and the whole thing, you know, handbrake, uh, fuel pump, no power steering? I mean, could you imagine yourself in that scenario for 500 miles? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I, <laughs> you wish, I, I wish that that I could have been from that era because there was so much, they, they, were, they were working with, with, they didn't have CNC machines, they didn't have, they didn't have a lot of stuff in yeah. the craftsmanship that they did, the quality they The cars out. were beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That and, 14 and car? They were worked to art. Oh you know my God. I mean? And uh, I would have loved to have been from that era and been a mechanic because everything was so new, you know, that would have been great. And then as far as being a driver... My grandpa told me, in fact, the first year he, he ran the Speedway, uh, after the race is over, I, I don't mean to, to sound, but he peed blood for almost a week because of the bricks and the and it just beat you to death. Beat the hell out of so your kidneys. So he would wear a kidney belt when oh he my ran God. the 500, yeah, to, to try to keep his insides from being shaken loose. <sighs> and he said that was one of the hardest things was on those bricks is, uh, is that the car would, and then the shock absorbers they had then, there wasn't much of a shock. And uh, he said it just beat you to death, you know? Well, all of that, and then so many drivers from that era did not survive. Yeah. I mean, that had to be ever-present in a man's mind as he climbed in for the Indianapolis 500 in 1928. I mean, I know a lot of them died doing it back then, but they still wanted to live like the rest of us. Yeah, but, but I mean, I don't know why they took on that risk. Let me tell you something as a race driver. When you get on a race car, you don't, you don't think about getting okay. killed. You just think about yeah. going fast. What about before? I, I no. Okay. Now, you know what? Even back then, that's your I mean, passion. That's what you yeah. want to do, and you don't worry about getting killed. You don't worry about the consequences. You just go out there and stand on the gas. Yeah. You talk about gladiators, though, from that era. <laughs> My right. God. And you know, to, and they really Louis Meyer the first paved the way for drivers today to one day earn a full time living going fast in circles. It wasn't that way then. They worked outside of that race car. You know. Yeah. What a fascinating time. It really was. Someone's paying you to field this car. Is that how it works? Or? Yeah, and, and that's you know it's a typical story. The driver that has the money isn't usually the one that has all the talent, and <laughs> <laughs> and you know like Simon Sykes, that kid has an enormous amount of talent, and you know he's got a few partners. One of them being Metalloid. Uh, it's also one of our partners. Um, it's really cool to have that support behind him where he can run for this championship now. You know this car's here and it's available and 
you know, I'd love to be able to have a sponsor to have on the side of it and pick a driver to drive it. But sure. just the way the, the world is today, you know, it's, you know, I've got talking to a few other drivers and yeah, they'll have to pay to drive it. Two years ago, um, I put a deal together to give Cody Swanson a shot in an Indy Pro car. And we went to uh, Lucas Oil. We went out and won the race for his first time in, our, in the rear engine formula car. And we thought, okay, if that, you know, if that gets him noticed, you know, maybe we can, you know, find a sponsor and start moving him up because Cody deserves to be an Indy car. Because that, that's my, kind of my dream is, is this team to where we could have partners together to where we can give those, those guys that don't have, you don't have the shot to be able to give them the shot. You know, I mean, I'd love to be able to have Cody Swanson in an Indy Lights car getting ready to move to Indy car. Of know? course, instead of the guy coming to you that's not really all that good in the chair, yeah. um, but he's got the sponsor. Yeah. Best scenario is Cody Swanson with a sponsor. Yeah. I mean, he really is, I think, one of the best drivers in America today. We just, he hasn't really got the opportunity to show it everywhere, but no. he really is something. Thing is, is it, a good man too. Not, oh, yeah. It, probably the best human being i've ever met I mean, that guy <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll go i'll buy into that, that he's, he's, he's amazing he's, so, he won his class we won the, yeah. the first year out yeah first year out he won so he yeah. can drive road course yeah i i don't doubt it for a moment i i got news for you cody swanson even takes my calls <laughs> yeah and you know you'd you'd think he was even glad to hear from me you know oh, yeah. and I, <laughs> no, he's just a good guy he's he good really man. is he's an amazing man I admire him a lot. Look at that. Mike's got a piece of history right here. Ooh, driftwood from Lake Michigan. Wow. <laughs> I've always wanted a piece of driftwood from Lake Michigan. <laughs> Altoona Speedway. What? Are you serious? Yeah, piece of wood from Altoona. From the board track? Yep. yep. Wow. And your great-grandfather won at Altoona in 1928 at 200, the same year he won his first AAA national championship. That would be... God, there's still a nail in it. So yeah. I, I tell you what my grandpa did tell me is, is, is you'd be driving on those board tracks and you'd look and the kids used to climb underneath them and like boards would be missing and they'd stick their head up oh my God. to look and to watch where the cars were coming. And he goes, you'd be driving along, you'd see some idiot stick his head up in there and kind of look and then they'd grab him and this get is, him out of there. This is how everything. fascinating this history is. Yeah. Can you even imagine something like that today? Yeah, no. You, you, can't, so. you can't get anywhere near the racing surface, yeah. as it should be. But yeah. So that's a story I've never heard on a board track. There, and they hauled ass on those board tracks back oh, then because they, they were super duper banked. Yeah. So some little kid sticks his head up through the track in a missing he, board. Can you imagine? <laughs> My God. This, I usually don't bring out but this was my great grandfather's his his uh, briefcase his really name and the years that he won engraved yes. this was given to me and i have a little collection inside of it of things that i got from him can i look inside yeah it? yeah it, um, that was your great grandfather's briefcase yes and uh so like you know just a few things that this hung above his uh workshop table forever where was his shop Gilmore, um, Gilmore Speedway. Yeah, Gilmore Speedway flag. And when he lived in Searchlight, he had this little like tin shed, and just everything was out. You know, he had a bunch Searchlight. Of stuff Searchlight, Nevada. Yeah. Oh. This was his knife. You know, had all wow. his LM for Louis Meyer mm -hmm. on it. That was his hunting knife. We go deer hunting. And, and some of the you know articles and stuff from when he passed away. You know, I saved a lot of. Oh the, yeah. A lot of the things. Um, Champion for sure. You know, that was probably one of the hardest days of my life. We we got to the services when he passed away. And when when did he pass? Nineteen ninety five. Ninety five. Okay. And we were in Las Vegas, Nevada, and um, so we got to the funeral home and everything. And and you know everybody's upset. Well, my dad got really upset there, and he couldn't stand up and say anything. So. My aunt looks at me and she goes, you need to get up and say some stuff about it. And you grandpa. had nothing prepared. I wasn't prepared. So I just Whoa. got up there and kind of winged it. And I'll tell you what. I think Went from the heart then. Hardest thing ever. But but you know what? I'm glad that I did because uh just made me feel good that I kind of, you know, was able to stand sure. up and talk about that it. That had to have taken a lot of courage, though. Well, Your it wasn't so much courage on my part. It was just it was just a loss, you know. Yeah. It just, yeah. It just was hard. It was just yeah. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. I would have loved to have known your grandfather. Or just, you know, just to have sat down and had, give me 10 minutes with Louis Meyer. Give me 10 minutes. I'll I, tell you one more story. I'm not going to get that it's, opportunity. Uh, You're the closest I got. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, 
Yeah. Was it the 33 race? I think so. They didn't have a banquet on the 33 race because of the way things were going. So Because of the Great Depression? or I, what? Yeah, I don't know if it was the Depression or what the deal was. I think it was the 33 race. They didn't have a banquet. So after the race is over, they just paid the drivers off and away they went. So when he'd get up later on and make a speech, he'd go, hey, how many people in this room remember the 1933 banquet? And people would raise their hands up, you know, and everything. And he goes, man, he goes, that's pretty good. Because he goes, we didn't have a banquet in 1933. And kind of their oh, my God, how embarrassing for the audience. He was always, he was that's funny. To something. I love that story. Just, uh, yeah, that's so cool. Here. To my great-grandson, Mike, Louie Meyer Sr. That's an original signature? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then uh, here's this 39. Uh, that's the crash. crash. crash, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. And that car. He got thrown out. Yes. And that yeah. car is at the, or was at the airport. I think it's back at the museum now. Because um, oh that God. thing ran for three or four more he, he years. Was, he was battling Wilbur Shaw to the end on that 1939. Yes. He would have been the first four-time yeah. winner. Well, he, <laughs> he was, he had the pole. He uh, was leading, he got, he spun out, had to come in, change tires because there was oil on the track, took the lead again, and then came in for a pit stop, came back out, and somebody had blown up, and he hit the, the oil, and that's what spun him out. Wow. Yeah. But, and then... I might, maybe that had something to do with the retirement. <laughs> yeah. But then... Well, I'll tell you what he said. At that time, the cars were getting so heavy yeah. and so bulky that he really wasn't enjoying driving them. It wasn't like driving the little 14 car, you know, it's just like cars. He had a lot of talent, and he, you know, just was... It was. They, were, they had to be gladiators then. I mean, you had to have... You know, no fear. Go out there yeah. and stand on the. But he was, you know, but he was very smart when he did it. And then jokingly, which this is something true, um, I looked at Casey. I said, "Well, he's, you know, he had six toes on his throttle foot, so he was a masher." <laughs> and you're like, "What?" You know, so everybody they kind of freak out when we tell people. But uh, I even stumped Donald Davidson with that. He has no, you know, no human on earth has ever stumped. Yeah. Donald well, Davidson. It, 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 I did. It was on. It was actually on. Uh, Dave Wilson had a radio. What show. What about the six toes? He had six toes. It was the uh, like for little, real. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god. Little toe had another toe that kind of grew off the side. Yeah. In fact, it was in Ripley's. Believe it or not, yeah. in the fifties. <laughs> Ripley's okay. Believe It or Not had a deal on Louis Meyer and the six toes on his throttle foot. Yeah. So My grandma had the uh, the deal that was in the that's paper. That's maybe the most interesting factoid of the day. <laughs> Louis Meyer had six toes. <laughs> Wow. Well, Casey's like, are you sure you didn't have like three balls? So you or stumped something? Donald <laughs> Davidson on that. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, no, it wasn't. That's yeah. that's serious bragging rights. Yeah. Nobody stumps Donald oh, Davidson on the history of the Indy 500. Because I told I told uh, Dave Wilson, I said, ask Donald what uh, what Indy 500 champion had six toes on his throttle foot, and Donald's like. I've never heard of that. <laughs> so, well, Mike could prove it because one day he was asleep in the chair. Yeah, I was, he had his shoes off. So Mike went over there and he goes, "I don't mean to be weird or nothing, but he does have six." <laughs> That's funny. I love it.